One of our easiest and most efficient methods for solving a quadratic equation is found in section 2.2.2, solve by square root property. This method is fast, it's efficient, it's simple, you're going to love it, but the bad news is it doesn't work on every quadratic equation. It only works on a certain subset of quadratic equations that have a special form. But when you notice this form, it's going to be a quick and easy solution. The square root property goes something like this. If x squared equals d, that is d is going to be some real number, so x squared equals a number, then x is equal to plus or minus square root of d. Now, it doesn't show it there, but we've actually taken the square root of both sides. So the idea in solving by square root property is you're going to have a quadratic term, you're going to be able to isolate it, and the only thing that's going to be left over is a constant. You're not going to have any linear or x terms. So you've got a quadratic term and a constant term only. Isolate the quadratic part, that is isolate the x squared, and then take the square root of both sides. In example 2a, notice we have the quadratic or the x squared term and just a constant left on the other side. So to solve this equation, we're going to take the square root of both sides. So I'm going to take the square root of the left side and the square root of the right side. Now let me remind you quadratic equations or x squared degree 2 equations have two solutions. So when we take the square root of both sides, where are we going to get the two solutions? We have to recognize that there's two square roots, a positive square root and a negative square root for every number. So just a quick easy example, the square root of 16 could be either positive or negative 4, right? Because 4 squared is 16 and negative 4 squared is 16. So we're going to recognize both roots when we take the square root of both sides. Now, the square root of x squared is x, and now we need to simplify the square root of negative 400. Notice the negative under the radical, we learned that that's going to be represented as an i, and we can recognize the square root of 400 is 20. So this particular quadratic equation has two solutions, but they're both imaginary. Now, let me remind you of a couple of things from your calculator. First of all, if you have your calculator in that complex mode, then you can type in square root of negative 400 and it will give you 20i. Now, as we've been doing with our other equations, we can check by substitution even if it contains an i. So notice I'm going to plug 20i in for x on the left side of the equation. Don't forget to find the i, we just press second decimal and square the left side. When we square 20i, that produces negative 400, which matches what we had on the other side of the equation. I can also check negative 20i. Um, do observe, I have my solution in parentheses because I want to square the whole thing. So that syntax does make a difference. So both of our solutions work, and our solution set then contains two imaginary solutions negative 20i and positive 20i. You can express your answer like this, or you can put it in a set of curly braces. So the square root property is fast and efficient. You'll probably like it better than factoring, but remember it only works on a subset of equations. That means if I come back up here and look at the equations that we were working on last time, I cannot apply the square root property to an equation like this. The reason is because we have this linear term right here, the x term. If your equation is missing the x term and you only have the quadratic and the constant term, then you can use the square root property. So if I spot that, I can use the square root property. Looking at example b, you may say, well, there's an x term right here. Not exactly. This whole term is a quadratic term. So my goal is to isolate the quadratic term. And in this case, we can do that simply by adding 8 to both sides. If I can isolate the quadratic term and only have a constant or a number left behind, then I can use the square root property. So at this point, we're going to take the square root of both sides, remembering the plus or minus on the right. 
And when we simplify the left here, square root of 3x minus 4 squared is 3x minus 4. Now, if we think about 8 as 4 times 2, then the square root of 4 will simplify, square root of 2 will not. So the square root of 8 is plus or minus 2 square root of 2. Now, unlike example A, we've got a little bit of work to do. We still need to solve for x. So we're going to do this by isolating x, adding 4 to both sides, and then dividing by 3. Now I'm going to show a little bit of extra work on this one so that we can learn how to manipulate all of these uh, constants. So I'm adding 4 to both sides in order to get that 3x by itself. And over here, these two terms are not like radicals, so I'm not going to really be able to combine them. What I am going to do is take the 4 and put it in front of the plus or minus, as opposed to saying plus or minus 2 squared to 2 plus 4, because this one's a little more readable. If you trap that plus or minus between your two terms, again, it's pretty easy to read. So to solve for x in this case, I'm going to divide all three of those terms by 3. And our solution then is 4 thirds plus or minus 2 square root of 2 over 3. It's not pretty, but it is the solution. So our solution set contains two irrational numbers. 4 thirds minus 2 square root of 2 over 3, that's one solution, and 4 thirds plus 2 square root of 2 over 3, okay? Now, we can even check this with our calculator. I'll show you two options with your calculator on this first example. I'm just going to plug it in directly. So I'm going to open parentheses, 3 times x. Now, x has more than one term, so I'm going to need to put that in another set of parentheses. 4 thirds minus 2 square root of 2. I'm going to use my right arrow key to get out of that radical and divide by 3. Okay, I'm going to close parentheses because that keeps the x value together. Now, the next thing I see in the equation there is minus 4. I'm going to close parentheses square that expression and subtract 8 and hope for a 0. Yep, we got a 0. Okay, so that shows me that the root with the negative, by root I mean solution, the solution with the negative is a, a correct answer. Now, shortcut. I'm going to press second enter on my calculator. That's going to recall what I just typed in. So that to check my next answer, all I have to do is edit. I'm going to change that minus to a plus and show that also balances the equation. So we are confident that we have the solution set. They are irrational, but they are exact and correct. Okay, let's try another example that's very similar to that. We can use the square root property to solve this one because we have the quadratic or the squared term isolated and nothing but a constant left on the other side. So I'm going to go ahead and take the square root of both sides. The square root and the square cancel on the left. We have 3x minus 4 equals plus or minus. Now let's think of 28 as 4 times 7. We can split up our radical square root of 4, square root of 7. The square root of 4 is 2 and the square root of 7 does not simplify. Okay. In the same way that I did on the last example, I'm going to solve for x. First, by adding 4 to both sides, and I'm going to sneak it in front to make it readable. We have 3x equals 4 plus or minus 2 square root of 7. And then I'm going to divide all three terms uniformly, don't forget anybody, by 3. And we've got our solution. x equals 4 thirds plus or minus 2 square root of 7 over 3. So again, we have two irrational solutions, and I'm going to go ahead and separate them. 4 thirds minus 2 square root of 7 over 3, and 4 thirds plus 2 square root of 7 over 3. Let me give you an alternative for checking these more complicated solutions in your uh, calculator. What I'm going to do is store those solutions in a variable in my calculator. Okay, so let me 
scoot over here. The first solution that I had there was 4 thirds minus 2 square root of 7 over 3. So I'm going to store that under a letter in my calculator. Okay, so I'm going to type in 4 thirds minus 2 square root of 7 divided by 3. Okay, so I'm plugging in my solution. Now, on the left side of my keypad there, I have an STO button. That's the store button. On my screen, I see a right arrow key. So it's going to take this value and store it under a letter. I'm going to pick letter A. Notice above your buttons, you've got your letters in green. So to access those letters, you first press that alpha key and then your letter. So the calculator no knows, store this value under letter A. The calculator approximates it, uh, but that's okay. So now, whenever I plug in my solution, instead of having to type in that long answer, all I have to do is type in alpha A. So I'm looking at the original equation. I'm plugging A in for X. And again, I accessed the A by pressing alpha A. When I press enter, we end up with 28, which shows we have a balanced equation. Okay, the other solution was very similar. It was 4 thirds plus 2 square root of 7. Make sure you use your right arrow key to get out of that radical before you divide by 3. And then I'm going to store this one in letter B. So I'm going to press alpha and then my apps button, which accesses the B. So to check this one, I'm going to type in 3 alpha B minus 4 close parentheses and square and we end up with 28 as well. Okay, so we can tell ourselves good job. That is the correct solution. So remember the square root property is fast and efficient, but it only works on those equations where you can isolate the squared part having nothing but a constant left behind.